Okay, welcome everyone. Um, oh, click OK. Yeah, yeah, welcome everyone to, uh, uh, I think this is the penultimate Ixa uh, seminar. Um, and this week we have uh, an internal one, but it's good because we're introducing a fellow uh, member of another research institute. So Jen Chubb has come over from Satsu uh, to talk about uh, AI. And that's quite nice, I think, because I believe Satsu will be relocating a bit nearer Ixa, so it'll be a good opportunity to start building some links and perhaps with a view to looking at some collaborations in the future as well. Um, Jen's work is also quite, quite a nice um, follow-up to some of the other topics that we've looked at uh, this uh, term around things like cybernetics and AI. So it's, uh, it's another sort of uh, a nice and probably quite a different uh, take some, on some similar issues that we've visited already. So that's quite cool. So Jen's going to talk a little bit about uh, AI futures and um, this, the case study that she's going to talk is uh, developing voice technologies for children. And I did actually invite people from the education department. I'm not sure if anyone made it, but welcome if you've, uh, if you've made it over from there. So I'll just hand it over to you now, Jen. Brilliant, thank you. Let me just uh, share the screen. Um, can everyone see that okay? Is that all looking okay? Yep, it's all good. Are you seeing it as a full slide? Not oh, no, actually, saying? it's switched to the presenter view now. Oh, how strange. Um, uh, that one might flip it. No. no. <laughs> Uh, one moment. I think it's display settings. Yeah. Swap. Yeah. Here we go. Apologies. Okay, Perfect. let's get the first thing right. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for for having me today. Um, uh, as um Phil says, I'll be sort of um standing in in terms of talking a little bit about what the um Satsu unit uh does and offers. Um. Uh, and uh, just to give you a flavour of some of the projects that I've been working on um, and uh, and obviously, you know, hopefully to foster some relationships um, across across the university. And I know we already have some of those going, but just to really try and um, give a flavour of some of the things I've been working on. Importantly, I'm, I'm not a, a uh, not a proper Satsu member, I suppose, because I, I, I actually am based in DC Labs. Um, but I'm under the supervision of Dr. Darren Reed, who is um, firmly placed in sociology. Uh, my background is actually philosophy. Uh, so I um, have started uh, my career looking more around issues of freedom and responsibility in science. Um, and more recently uh, focused in on uh, emerging technologies um, and particularly AI with this more, more recent project and a fellowship as well, which I'll be starting in September. So I'll be sticking around uh, um, uh, as well um, with Satsu moving over. Um, and that, that fellowship will be in XR Stories, um, which I'll tell you about if there's, if there's time. So the intention of today is really to give you a flavour of some of the things I've been working on, um, sort of provide an idea of some of the themes that came out of our, of our current project, uh, which comes to an end in uh, next month. But there are some publications arising from that, as you'd expect. So just quickly to say then, uh, you'll all have come across DC Labs, I'm sure. DC Labs um, it has another extension actually to into next year. Um, and um, it will take a, a similar form with uh, colleagues across the university working uh, across the digital creativity theme, people interested in both the technological aspects of, 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 of development in creativity, but also looking at the social implications of it. Um, and DC Labs will continue to be um, on HES East. Uh, and my project came about um, as the brainchild of Professor Peter Cowling, who um, is now at Queen Mary's, but who was very interested in all this talk around AI, um, but nobody was really sort of um, looking at what we actually wanted, I think, from it. Um, his take on it was very much that um, we hear so much about all these developments and, of course, you know, DC Labs itself is part of those developments, uh, developing games, uh, looking at AI and health technologies, all of these kinds of de developments take place. But um, how often do we actually stop and, and question whether we, we want those and what kind of future we, we want? And so 
the project really came about as a result of his desire um, to kind of reflect on those questions and to pose those questions to experts or thought leaders, if you like, uh, around the AI field and um, and specifically that 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 range of uh, perspectives comes from not only computer science and where you'd expect to find AI, but across the board through social science and humanities as well. And Peter, being an AI um, uh, computer scientist himself, uh, required a social scientist, uh, as I now am because I collect data, um, to, to do this work. And so this postdoctoral position was for a couple of years to, to really go out into the field, or go out, I didn't leave the room in the end because of the pandemic, sadly, but to go out and actually uh, discuss, interview um, uh, thought leaders around some of the issues that we were interested in. So uh, my background is very much on uh, qualitative, uh, qualitative research. Um, now, this is a little uh, sketch that was, uh, was drawn up for us by a, a company that work a lot with DC Labs. Uh, and you could pull apart this a little bit, and we spent far too much time on it. Um, but it was part of our thinking around um, where we wanted the AI Futures uh, project to, to start. And, and this, this image formed part of our, um, our, our interview technique, actually. So, um, as I say, we wanted to ask the question, how could we live better with AI and digital technology? And on the right hand side, you can kind of see all the distractions that AI could uh, afford our lives. Um, some of them good, some of them perhaps less good. On the left, you can see the more mindful activity of the individual playing with their dog, uh, the, the cat, you know, entertaining you, sitting on the on the rubber hoover there. Um, and this is really not to be critiqued, um, but really just to kind of get people thinking, yeah, actually, is this, are the developments in AI making us happy? Uh, what, what positives do they bring? And are there positive stories we can tell about AI um, that move us away from some of the more polarised uh, stories that we might see either proliferated in, in, in cultural, you know, sort of uh, in popular media, or even within the scientific community itself, whereby we either see development or we see critique of existential risk around AI. And of course, there is uh, there is a there is a, a benefit to both, uh, but there is a nuance and there's a middle ground, perhaps. And so, um, so these were the, the questions that we asked, and and of course. One of the things that we first did with um, our design of the project uh, was to actually um, consider vignettes that we might pose to our to our um, interviewees and say, you know, with this kind of future in mind, how do we feel when we have it, when we have AI in our lives in this way? Where where would it benefit you at work and life um, and in and leisure activities? And I can come on to that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, so this is a little bit of a playful kind of image, if you like, that kind of was to to grasp the, the idea of what we were looking at. Um, and um, so, as I say, it's a very interdisciplinary project, um, and most of my, my work has been of this nature, really. Um, and as I say, it, it, it brings together that expertise in computer science, but also with that more qualitative expertise. Um, and with Darren as well, working closely, um, Darren's been able to consider things around discourse analysis, conversational analysis, and brings that more sociological um, approach to, to our project. So it's been quite a uh, there's been a sort of a, a triple approach, really, if you like, from a disciplinary perspective. Um, um, and ultimately, what we hope to inform there are our policies. Um, we know that there's a, a, a range of uh, focus, uh, uh, an increasing focus on, on, on the policy development around AI and regulation, um, but also to be playful with it, to think about what creative output we could, we could, we could uh, generate. And in particular, being based in DC Labs, uh, we were hoping that views from our interviews could potentially inform the development of the game. And that's, that is, that's in, in its sort of uh, fledgling uh, uh, stages at the moment, but it's uh, entirely possible that we might be able to create a game which now allows 
individuals to play with alternative futures, to consider the role of AI uh, in a more decision-making process uh, from the perspective of a policymaker, from the perspective of a technologist, or from the perspective of just uh, the, the, the public more, more broadly, and uh, from you, from your, your own perspective. Um, and such a game could um, be online uh, as a role-playing game. I think we're sort of we're seeing it. Um, and this builds on some of the ideas that we've, and some of the chats we've had with uh, University of Oxford who have developed a, a game to do similar things um, around AI governance. And that talk, um, sorry, that game is called Intelligence Rising. And there's a paper on archive if you're interested. So to kind of have a bit more of a playful approach to, to, to this, um, and, and I've been certainly trying to talk where I can um, to people about some of the ideas that have emerged. Some of them won't be too surprising to you, I'm absolutely sure. Um, and for a talk like this, it's quite difficult to kind of give you the granularity and the richness of our data without literally giving you a, um, a walk through all of, our, all of our papers. But I'm hoping today will spark some interest and, and I can go into things in more depth with you individually. Uh, and just to say that this is us talking at, uh, at uh, your night um, with the robot now, which is in computer science, uh, quite a limited robot, but I would say very interested, interesting to see the response from the public. And part of the project is, is, is about that as well. It's about thinking about where those dominant narratives are and what the perception is of the public towards AI. And of course, that often tends to err towards robots. Um, Interestingly, we had a, um, a young autistic child on the on front row. Uh, I know this because his father contacted me after the talk, um, who took huge interest in, in, in the subject uh, and then also in the robot in, in embodiment itself. Um, and his father emailed after and said, you know, this is something that, um, you know, my son is, is particularly interested in and feels particularly attuned to. Um, and so there are, this reach of the of the project and interesting you know interesting ideas that emerge when we talk to the public about it is, is kind of core to to what I'm interested in. So the design of the of the project for AI futures and I will uh, come on to talking about the um, ethical design of children's voice technologies. But the design of the AI futures project at large was really to to start to do a comprehensive mapping of research. Um, across AI futures. And when I say that, I'm talking about centres that are actually designated to thinking about um, uh, futures. Um, and, and they tend to they tend to sit in philosophy, actually, or, or are quite interdisciplinary um, units. Uh, so I'm thinking of places like the Future Humanity Institute um, at Oxford, which is led by Bostrom, the uh, Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is led by Sharon Valor, uh, Sharon Valor, uh, rather, um, again, a philosopher, um, and the Leverhulme Centre for, for Future Intelligence, again, led by uh, scholars from the humanities, um, and, uh, but, but working across the sciences as well. Um, and so I spent a lot of time working out what they were focused on, seeing where the, the research effort was. And I think this is an emerging field in and of itself. Um, I spent also a lot of time, and this was quite a fun bit, you know, analysing popular media and science fiction, looking at the ways in which uh, AI is portrayed in the media and in film uh, and uh, more generally in documentary. Um, and then I conducted um, 25 uh, semi-structured interviews with AI thought leaders and scholars across a range of different disciplines. Um, and we're in the stage of doing interviews and the survey with policy and decision makers and, and technologists. Um, there is a sister project, as I say, um, I've been working on, which I'll come on to. Um, and throughout this, um, it's, it, it's, it's involved thematic analysis, but, um, but also uh, inductive coding. So it's been quite interesting to see that whilst we asked our interviewees, um, you know, very sort of clear, sort of semi-structured questions, we, was, we still sort of got some really nice nuance and some interesting areas, which actually have, uh, may well form the development of, of further papers. Um, and so the questions that we asked our participants in, included, can you tell me a little bit about what dominant narratives you think the, um, the public perceive around AI? Um, can you tell me to the extent to which they uh, differ from reality, if at all, and in what ways? Um, who features in those stories? Uh, who's telling them? Um, and then within that, who ought to feature within those stories? or What, what stories are missing? Um, 
do we, you know, do we desire those sorts of futures? Are they desirable? Um, where, where could opportunities lie for AI? Um, and then moving us sort of aside from the story aspect, um, going into really asking about their own reflections of where, how they feel about living with AI. So their, their reflections on uh, its effects in their work. So of course the scholarly individuals, uh, it was you know, the you know, future of the university, AI in the university, both for teaching and research. And we have a paper coming out about um, research and AI uh, used for in, as an enabler in the research process itself. Um, and then we'd also ask them about um, their, 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 their reflections on AI um, in culture and their, their game playing, if you like, or their music habits or, you know, those sorts of things. And, um, uh, and so um, these were very much personal reflections, which we were then able to then move forward from there and then say, OK, well, how do we, given that you've given us these kind of examples of where AI could be useful to you or might, might make, you, make you thrive as a person, dare I even say it, make you happy. Um, I didn't use that word, but, um, you know, I think it's nice to think about humanity thriving under these kind of, you know, in these kinds of conditions. Um, but then, so how do we get there then? Um, how do we, who do needs to be involved and how do we get to a beneficial future with AI? Um, and where are the, where the roadblocks? And I think that's where the ethical decision discussions really came in. Um, so, as I say, the, the mapping that took place um, was not certainly not an exhaustive mapping of, of institutes that are looking at AI, um, but we can see that the concentration of AI features type work and my nice bubble diagram, uh, which is available, I think, uh, on a blog, um, could be grouped around the, the, the themes that you see there. Um, and so our work really does fit quite neatly into some of these ideas. Um, and they, importantly, that these institutes um, cut across a range, a range of domains of use. And I think it's important to note that the interviews that we spoke to um, were coming from a range of different perspectives, um, i.e., you know, thinking about it with respect to healthcare or thinking about it with respect to creativity. Um, but with respect to the, the policy and the uh, technologist interviews and survey work we're doing, that is around digital creativity and that is much more focused on the creative industries. But I think, and, and there, would, there will be different opinions on this, but certainly in Satsu, when I first started designing this, Darren and Andrew Webster and I sat down and um, Andrew in particular is very, very keen on ensuring when we think about these kind of implications, we consider the context of which they're, what they're in, which may say, sound um, straightforward and, and, and sort of an obvious thing to say, but often um, these things are, are, are sometimes viewed outside of those domains. So we were very keen to, to ensure that we looked at, uh, looked at those. And you can see that they're, they're mapped out there. Um, Philip said at the beginning that Science and Technology Studies Unit is going to be moving over to HESI. So I just wanted to say that, of course, these are some of the areas that um, SATSU sits across. And I'm, so I'm delighted to be able to work more closely with, with SATSU because you have their individuals who are working on a range of areas, whether that's science fiction and narratives as we've sort of described, responsible innovation, um, human computer interaction. Uh, these kinds of um, issues, and then of course futures as a, as a more broader heading, um, these kinds of issues, uh, you know, really do require, and I think we're seeing that even more now, uh, it, both in the literature and in policy, um, we need to bring together the, the, the science uh, or the technical with the, with the social side and, and the, the drive to consider the ethical implications of technology, which I think we're seeing more now, um, you know, really reflects that. So I think bringing these things under one roof to a certain extent is, is certainly the way of the, uh, the way I see um, a lot of these centres moving. Um, I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the entirety of Satsu, but I, I can see benefit for that. Um, so these interviews that we carried out, um, so just briefly to just say that um, we, um, we have biographies of the individuals, uh, that, but they are uh, anonymized. Uh, what I mean to say there is that they are more character based, so they're, they're, they're talking about the kinds of individuals and the kind of backgrounds that they have, which would um, sort of situate them as, as experts. Um, and they cut across a range of domains, as I've mentioned. 
and we were particularly interested and I was particularly interested in making sure that there was some gender representation across these these interviews in light of the very clear issue around obviously in STEM but also within AI and we, we see um, you know in the last few years particularly the Ada Lovelace Institute um, and um, of course the Royal Society and others um, you know actually publishing papers on where are all the women in AI um, I know it's an issue in, in many other places as well in philosophy as well um, but we were trying to ensure that we did get a range of voices and I'm pleased to say we did actually I think it was over 70 percent of our, of our of our representation in the end ended up being um, a, a female um, and so but I think that's important that we did, we, we made we made an attempt to ensure that the, the range of voices were coming um, through, um, and also just thinking also about um, within the analysis um, how far they are reflective of um, broader voices and broader views, and I think that's a, that's a key issue when we think about AI and bias more generally. Not only are the people who are studying it um, possibly uh, coming from a privileged. Um, group so too are the people who are designing it and I think I want to be as bold as to say when we when we ask that question what do we want from a future with AI we have to question who we include in that we um, and I think that's uh, something that's really really key and really important um, so some emerging themes um, and I'm not going to go into them all obviously for the uh, purposes of today but that we looked around dominant narratives, as I mentioned. We also asked about the likelihood of artificial general intelligence, which we see very much of the preoccupation of those in the existential risk um, sort of categories. Um, and uh, indeed, in, in portrayals of, of AI in the media, often this kind of conflation with super intelligence or the singularity, if you like. Um, and we were we were very um, interested to see how many uh, of our of our um, our interviewees actually wanted to pull it back from that and felt that the, some of those issues were very distracting from the pressing needs of today, particularly with respect to algorithmic injustice and things like that. Um, issues around responsible development of AI and ethics, which leads me on to my case study. Um, we had a little on the nature of consciousness and intelligence. Um, again, these are, these are for us to talk about following this talk. Um, some interesting ideas around uh, portrayals of robotics um, and, and the perceptions thereof as well, and, and that, that embodied interaction. Um, and I'll show you something in a moment around that. And then a huge, huge vast of the, uh, amount of the conversations tended towards being around diversity, representation and equality in, in AI, um, whether that's those people who are telling the stories or whether that's people studying it or whether that's those people who are designing the, product, the, the technology, just considering the ways in which they, um, they might conflict with some, some issues of, of diversity. Um, so let me tell you just a, a, just a few uh, of the headlines then, if you like, from the AI Futures Project. Um, so the first, main I would say the main takeaway is around these narratives is around this polarization um, and I want to um, pause and ask you to think about um, what if the first science fiction film or you know first narrative you came across around AI was actually something like Wally. I don't know if you're familiar with Wally, but he's a friendly little robot who starts to develop empathy and emotions and re build relationships with with the other uh, robots that are about and goes around cleaning up the planet that the uh, that the humans have made a mess of um, and I think this is a pertinent question when we think about what how how it dominant narratives kind of influence generations because of course young people young people um the youth um now will probably be well, well you, you may ask them about ai one they'll say well it's everywhere they'll probably know broadly where it is and, and what it, how it's used you may not understand its implications or how safe they are within it but also they may they may go to this kind of more commonly um seen positive story almost of, of ai and how it can have good implications but they might also flip to um, some of the more um, uh, dystopian <laughs> uh, narratives, if you like. Um, and whereas I think for my generation, um, you know, the first sort of um, thing that pops to mind inevitably are things like Terminator and the flashing red eyes. 
Um, so we have a paper coming out about AI stories um, and how we feel that there are there is a bit of a crisis here that, there, that we have these kind of polarised um, views. And this builds a lot on what the Royal Society have been doing um, around AI narratives and, and the Legal Human Centre for Future Intelligence. Um, so again, some really lo lovely rich data about the kinds of opportunities that exist within AI, the kinds of narratives that could be told, the power of stories, which obviously help us make sense of the world, um, and you know who's telling them, and, 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 and issues of AI and power, I think, are inevitably fall into this. Um, some of the dominant narratives you can see there in this uh, lovely little graph um, are, are, are depicted here. Um, without question, the, the, the response from our experts was that people will think that it's, it's, it's preoccupied with surveillance and privacy. This is, this is you know, one of the biggest negatives, if you like. Most people will conflate it with superintelligence and the singularity. Um, there will be a, a preoccupation with science fiction. There will be a preoccupation with Silicon Valley and big tech. Um, Equally, you know, just under is job loss, uh, of course, as a, of a kind of as a kind of um, real concern across the public, and and a conflation with robotics and embodied AI. Um, you can see some of the other um, kind of areas, and I think they're kind of interesting when you think they're not the experts' views of, of, of where AI is, but they're the experts' views of where they think uh, people um, feel uh, are the most commonly um, common um, narratives, if you like. Um, and along with this, you know, there's a lot of um, sort of emotional language, um, fear, paranoia, um, panic. Um, and I think that we have a job to do within these kinds of projects and across the university as well to give that more leveled out um, sort of description to the public. And, and that's obviously part of the impact agenda as well, I think. Um, Again, embodied AI was a huge one. You see me here pictured with Pepper, um, and um, who's based in computer science. And Pepper's quite a narrow AI, um, you know, very quite limited, really. You can dance, do things, but you know, you have to really command those things. Uh, inevitably, um, the application of, of robotics in society, um, again, it was seen to be quite a, a thorny issue. Um, even companion robots, although there was an acceptance within our data set that actually people are more likely probably to accept um, robots now because of the pandemic, um, because they cannot, of course, get the virus. And so that was quite an interesting shift. And, and I would just note again, you know, from a sociological perspective, how a shifting sense of the present might shape, reshape our future. Um, and so what was once seen as a kind of, you know, uh, uncanny valley-esque is now maybe more um, acceptable. Um, a huge theme of our work looks at algorithmic bias and injustice and the experts were very, um, very indignant on this, this issue. We are starting to see um, more documentaries emerging, uh, more scholarly work, uh, Sophia Noble's work and Rehab Benjamin, who are well-known um, scholars um, in, in sociology and looking at technologies. Um, and in computer science as well, you know, are very keen to ensure that we hold a mirror up um, uh, to AI and think about some of the racial uh, biases that seep through in technology, um, and particularly around facial uh, re recognition. Um, and so a big theme of, of our research is to try and um, unpack some of those ethical concerns around, around bias and, and, and inequalities. I'm aware of time, so I'm, I'm just giving you the headlines. And then regulation, of course, was another aspect. We see the, um, uh, in the uh, you know, in, in, uh, everyone's thinking about what the EU are, do, are doing now with respect to regulation. And they've laid out plans um, to think about how we can uh, adopt sort of European values at the heart of this sort of fast developing technologies. And so there's another key area um, and responsible innovation. Um, fundamentally as well for scholarly futures, I think it's really important that another huge area that emerged was around research itself. We have a paper coming out around, um, around this, uh, so how our experts referred to the role of AI as an enabler in the research process, both in terms of its design, hypothesis, um, you know, uh, design, and also through to its dissemination. Um, 
this comes at a time when UKRI are particularly interested in this um, and, and have set out a quite ambitious plan, which basically says, you know, the, the, the fundamental research needs to go on between the social sciences and the humanities across technical development in order to ensure that it's being deployed ethically uh, in society. And this came out in, in February. So I think there's a big um, focus now on how AI is being used in, in universities and, in, and in, in terms of research itself. And as I say, we, we have a paper which is going through the, the general iterations of, of, of publication things um, that that looks at how on the whole our, uh, our, our sample were very keen to limit AI to the more mundane tasks um, certainly um, not um, not particularly favorable of it being used within peer review and process that, was, that were really require that human judgment again probably not that surprising to you but again there are there are nuances within that data and I think it's important to think about how we do see it, it being more used certainly through the pandemic we're using it now with zoom um, and um, through teaching as well as as well as research um, and then finally, another big theme was to actually to educate, so not to just focus on regulation, but that there was a big need to actually educate the public, educate those people um, across the ecosystem, if you like, of, of AI, um, to, to really put the pieces together to make sure that the, what was being deployed um, was, um, was going to be responsible and was going to keep people safe and, um, and enable humanity to actually thrive. I have a cat walking across the screen, I'm really sorry. So um, this moves us on to um, the, the project that I wanted to just give you a little bit of a flavour of as well. Um, and this is uh, a, a particular project that we did um, through XR Stories funding. Um, so XR Stories is a neighbouring project to DC Labs focused on uh, immersive and digital storytelling. And again, very much focused on the creative industries. Um, and what we we did here was to uh, work with a uh, an actual uh, a company which is based in Sheffield uh, called Joy Polloy um, to develop a prototype um, which would um, enable children to talk to their favorite uh, character um, after their favorite program, let's say, uh, through um, a voice agent. Uh, and this work was with uh, James uh, um, and uh, Sondes uh, and uh, Liam and also Shauna, who's based in Cambridge. Um, so a range of us working together on this. And my job was to review the literature around the ethics. OK, so we've collaborated with Joy Polloy, as I said, they're a BAFTA award winning digital agency um, and they are really interested in trying to develop really engaging content um, for young people that enables them to carry on their discussion with their favorite character uh, so it's a meta story uh, chat tool um, and the key thing was how do we ensure that we, they engage safely uh, with these characters um, how do we ensure that it's still entertaining for them how do we ensure that their parents um, are comfortable with this interaction um, and their, their idea for the prototype was to use Amazon Alexa or Google Home. However, I've also done a bit of work with the BBC who have developed a, an in um, a, a, an actual beta tool for um, within, within computing systems, which is called Beeb, for, um, whereby you can again interact with, um, with an agent uh, through your screen. Um, this is nearing completion. Um, and a big part of my work was looking at the, um, as I say, looking at the literature to see where the issues lay for thinking about um, development, responsible development of, of, of conversational AI for children in, in the creative industry specifically. Uh, and my colleagues in DC Labs, um, they were particularly interested in, in the technical aspects. So Liam, who's in music, um, he was interested in, in the audio aspect and then um, Sondes and James, much more from the AI perspective, thinking about how do we actually combine these, these issues. Um, and just uh, just so we know, I'm sure we're all aware, but when we're referring to conversational AI, we're talking very much about chatbots or voice assistants that people can actually talk to. Um, they obviously rely on large volumes of data, machine learning and NLP um, to imitate human interaction, uh, recognising speech and text. 
Um, and I think this quote's quite compelling. Already one in four children between five and 16 years of age are living in a household with a voice activity, activated virtual assistant. Um, that was 2019, there's probably more now, especially through the pandemic. Um, but if we also reflect on, on, on how far um, it is ubiquitous in our homes and in our lives, um, I think it, it's, it's a really key area that we, we stop and pause and think about the implications for children um, who are accepting it as acceptable in their lives. Um, just uh, whereas, you know, some, for our generation, it, it was it was completely um, it was completely different story. Um, so this comes at a time when there's a particular uh, focus on the implications of conversational AI, particularly with respect to children's cognitive, social and linguistic development. How are they learning to speak? How are they learning to ask questions? Uh, Philip mentioned that we um, you'd sent the uh, the talk through to education. Um, I, I work and have been hoping to work uh, further with uh, Dr. Zoe Handley, who's particularly interested in these areas, um, because, of course, the way a child interacts with with a, with a voice assistant will ultimately inform um, how they see the world. Um, there are issues around their social development, um, issues around gendering AI. What does a child learn about how to engage with um, with um, different genders? Um, are they expecting a quick response because Alexa gives them it? Are they expecting that from their mother? Um, what are they learning about women if they assume that Alexa or Cortana are female? And, um, and so there's a lot of literature on these kinds of issues and, and, then, and they're absolutely um, vital to us um, considering the, the ethical development of these technologies. Um, and of course, within that, um, I mentioned the audio aspect, but of course the script and the, and the dialogue itself are really important too, because they, again, um, they again uh, could, uh, could, could inform how the child learns, but also um, bias can seep through. Um, so we were very much interested in thinking about the accent of, of, of these technologies, um, the actual voice itself, the persona, what we wanted children to, Kind of learn about the, uh, the technology um, and to feel also that it was reflective of them they were all very unique we were all unique um, and so it shouldn't necessarily just be this one uh, size fits all and so with moves towards the ethicization if you like of ai um, efforts to actually address uh, children's ai is a particularly pertinent uh, and there are real uh, moves with unicef to do this um, and the department um, uh, for culture and media uh, have, have done a lot of um, quite important policy papers lately on online harms. Um, so we're mapping these things together uh, and it was a it was a it was a short term project, but um, it's one that's leading on to my fellowship in September. So I'll be focusing that bit more on on these aspects. Um, and I think I've just sort of described this, but yeah, the, the idea was to bring together the technical with the ethical. So we're aiming for um, an, an ethically human-centered conversational AI, which, which acknowledges the uniqueness of individuals, um, as opposed to some of the other forms of, of technology. Just aware of time. Um, and so within uh, Sondes's work, she was particularly concerned with obviously the technical aspects. Um, so at the same time as me reviewing the ethics, she was looking at the technical implications of conversational AI, looking at how different, uh, I'm seeing to have lost a, a line there, looking at how different methods pose different uh, and distinct ethical challenges uh, technically, um, and then um, combining um, approaches um, with, with our work so the implications, as I think I've sort of mentioned uh, briefly there, um, are, are sort of um, in four main areas. One is around cognitive and linguistic development of children. So how, they how they're educated, what they're learning, and whether they can access this technology. Um, and again, this relates quite closely to what the BBC have been doing. Um, conversation AI has in, uh, implications for the, the moral and social codes of behavior that they're learning, as I've mentioned as well. And there's big, big part of the literature is about civility. Um, the BBC told me when I was working with them that they were particularly uh, observant of in their focus groups, young people mocking voice agents, young people being rude to voice agents. Indeed, this is not just young people, but adults 
swearing or, or even going as far as to abuse voice agents. Um, there's an interesting paper, I'd blush if I could, um, which I would, I would point you towards um, around civility and voice agents. So some really quite deep societal concerns there. And then of course, things around privacy, security, consent, permissions, and, and the standard things that we would we know and, and we know we know well um, around uh, ensuring that these systems are trustworthy. Um, what does that actually mean? How do we know what, whether to trust something? Um, and this relates, you know, so importantly for children because of their um, obviously because they're a vulnerable population. Um, and then also about inclusivity, as I've mentioned there, and how we stop or we mitigate against that seeping into the design of conversational AI. Um, so again, I, I may be repeating this actually, but yeah, we can see that into four sort of um, areas then. Um, and um, our review was then put back to Joy Polloy, who, who, um, you know, who looked at these areas and, and then developed almost a checklist or a set of principles from which to think about designing um, the technology more responsibly. Um, and I would say that we draw together these kinds of findings um, by thinking about a range of questions. Sorry, I've just jumped on. Um, one of the main things that would, would actually define uh, the responsible development of these technologies to, is to question what data will be collected and used and when, um, how it will be used, uh, how far in relation to which regulations the AI has been safeguarded for children's privacy and safety, um, how we develop it so that it's still engaging, um, how the AI should actually behave uh, based on the audience in which we're aiming at, um, and, and how we mitigate against bias, how do we ensure responsible innovation processes, i.e. bringing together a participatory design technique, if you like, um, and then what those technology and those approaches should look like in order to uh, provide moral care and direct pro-social behaviour, I guess. Um, and so I think I've just run you through those actually. Um, and it, so it was really about sort of starting it out from those, those, um, those kinds of issues and, and to challenge um, assumptions of neutrality um, within the technology. Um, and our paper on bringing together the, 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 the ethical with the technical um, for children in creative industries uh, for storytelling will be out in the International Journal of Child Computer Interaction. Uh, soon, as I say, it's still going through the usual mill. Um, I want to just briefly end because I'm sure there might be some questions or if not, there might be some online chats uh, following this. I just want to briefly say that this forms, as I mentioned, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the direction of the, the fellowship. So continuing to work with Darren, continue to work with DC Labs as well. Um, I'll be doing a two-year fellowship looking at the ethics and responsible research and innovation. Um, of AI for the next generation, which I've um, uh, referred to as Erica, um, which is always nice to give something a little bit of a, a, little bit of a synonym. Um, and so this fellowship will sort of build on what we've done with Joy Ploy, um, and I'll work cl more closely with them um, and also with uh, the BBC and, and other projects across um, the XR portfolio, um, which looks at interactive storytelling in immersive media. And in particular, they're quite interested in VR and AR as well. Um, so my work will look at the XR theme, the use of big data and AI to shape narrative content creation delivery. Um, you can see here, we've got robots now who are writing books, reading books. Um, <laughs> GPT-3 is uh, you know, an, an example where we're seeing um, machine learning being used for all these purposes. AI can tell jokes now, but does it know if it's funny? Um, AI can draw Van Gogh, but does it know that it's pretty? Um, these are really interesting questions and, 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 and particularly when we think about how children are learning. And on the right here, you've got um, an, an example from, um, I forget its name, it's called Whispers in the Night. Yes, so Lucy, a, a virtual being, a character that children can actually engage with through, through VR. Um, and these stories, when you're brought into them, are really compelling, they're really close to you and, and, and they will inevitably shape how young people understand and interact with AI. And so hopefully but through working um, on this little R&D project, we'll be able to uh, get a real sense um, through interviews, through workshops, um, 
and through the development of, of policies and, 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 and principles, um, get a real sense of how this is affecting and how we can reflect on these processes as we go through. Um, so yes, yeah, so I mentioned that we'll be working with these two areas. But I think going more into the future, we, you know, we can see that, um, so we've got um, Shatner on the right there, um, who's taken part in Storyfile, which is a creative in industry uh, company, which are uh, do these videos um, of, of individuals um, that, you know, they take um, hours and hours and hours and hours of conversation with, uh, with actors or individuals, then you can then live back and have a conversation with these individuals so Shatner in his own way is going to live on <laughs> through this and go ask ourselves how far people want to upload themselves through AI but anyway that's another question about um uh, how how special we think we are as humans but um that's that's something that's being done and we see uh, virtual holocaust survivors being brought back through vr and storytelling of this kind so there's really interesting social questions about what we're learning what we understand about our world what we understand about the future through these technologies and i hope we've given you a flavor of some of the things that we've been looking at i appreciate some of it's quite broad um but i'm very happy to to chat to you further on my email um, i'm always happy to to um, discuss ideas about collaboration as well thank you thanks so much that was really interesting um, no problems if you love the cat like... <laughs> <laughs> yes always welcome to see she's a cat. gone now i think she, she was scratching away at the door um but yeah she's uh she's about <laughs>